Well, good day, everyone. My name is Kenneth Kahn. I'm Dean of the Monte Hooja College Business here at Cleveland State University. And it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the fall 2021 edition of our college's Cornerstone Speaker Series. This program exemplifies our college's vision to be Northeast Ohio's business cornerstone and in doing so provide our region with business ready talent, impactful business knowledge and foundational community engagement, such as today's event. Along with welcoming you, I have the honor of introducing our moderator today. Dr. Benjamin Barron, Ben, is an esteemed associate professor in our Department of Management, focusing on the areas of human resource management and organizational behavior. He consults with numerous companies and is co-host of the renowned Indigo podcast. A US Navy officer, he continues to serve as a captain in the US Naval Reserve. When not working in the worlds of academia, business, and military, he enjoys hanging out with his wife and children. Dr. Barron, thank you for being our host today. Thank you so very much, Ken. I really appreciate it. And welcome, everyone, to today's session. The topic for today is the state of business in Greater Cleveland post-COVID. Now, certainly, we are continuing to manage amid COVID. We're not necessarily post-COVID yet, but there's so many facets that we need to consider and what we are considering as business leaders and really across the region and beyond with regard to worker health and safety, the availability of employees, the leadership challenge of remote work, uh, new and emerging strategic threats and opportunities. And today is really special because we are so fortunate to have two key leaders, Harlan Sands and Beju Shah, with us today to provide some insights on these and some related topics. So what I'll do is go ahead and introduce both of our guests and then we will move forward. Harlan Sands is the president of Cleveland State University. Since joining CSU as president in 2018, he has accelerated the university's upward trajectory as a Carnegie High Research Institution nationally recognized for quality, access, affordability, and social mobility. Additionally, the Brookings Institution ranked CSU 18th in the nation among public universities that provide social mobility for their students and conduct vital research that benefits society. Since he joined CSU, overall enrollment and progression rates are stronger than ever, boasting the largest fall freshman class in history in 2019, an increase in graduate enrollments in 2020, and increases in retention and graduation rates across the board for all student groups. His strategic leadership of CSU includes financially strengthening the institution and creating local enrollment partnership pipelines with Cuyahoga Community College, Lorraine Community College, and Lakeland Community College. He previously served in leadership roles at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Louisville, the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and Florida International University. Prior to academia, he practiced law as an assistant public defender, and he served for more than a decade on active duty as an officer in the U.S. Navy. Harlan, thank you for joining us. Beiju Shah is the president and CEO of Greater Cleveland Partnership, the region's leading economic development organization and with over 12,000 members, the largest metropolitan chamber of commerce in the nation. Guided by a, corporate bo a board of corporate and entrepreneurial CEOs, the organization focuses on accelerating growth and inclusive prosperity through strategic initiatives, business services, real estate, and advocacy. Prior to his current role, he served as the Senior Fellow for Innovation at the Cleveland Foundation, the world's first community foundation with assets of $2.8 billion. His work centered on catalyzing growth initiatives for the region, including leading the Cleveland Innovation Project. Shaw remains a member of the Impact Investing Board Committee, which directs a $150 million portfolio allocation of the foundation. He has held numerous additional prior leadership roles, including as the CEO of Biomotive and co-leader of the Harrington Project for Discovery and Development, a national drug development initiative. He was also the CEO and co-founder of BioEnterprise, an accelerator and industry growth initiative formed with Cleveland Clinic, Case Western Reserve University, and University Hospitals of Cleveland. Beiju, thank you for joining us. So the agenda here is I'm going to go through and allow Harlan and then Beiju to offer some prepared comments on today's topic. And then we'll have a facilitated question and answer session that I will moderate, followed of course by your questions as time permits. So I'll turn it over first to President Sands, if you would, Indulge us, please, to offer your comments. Well, thank you, Ben. And what Ben didn't say is he outranks me by two ranks in, as a Navy captain. I, I only made it to lieutenant commander. So first of all, congratulations, Ben. And thank you for your work here at Cleveland State. We're really lucky to have you and your leadership uh, in our Hoosier College of Business. 
Uh, and thank you for that warm introduction. Beiju, it's absolutely my pleasure to be here with you uh, sharing this webinar and sharing the things that we're both thinking about with lots of partners in Cleveland on how we move things forward. I think I'd like to start my opening comments by um, kind of refreshing an op-ed piece I wrote when COVID hit that talked about the things that we collectively need to do in Cleveland to advance our city and our region and the things specifically that CSU is going to do to help drive this. And there's really four thrusts uh, that I'd like to talk about today. And all of these are important as we think about uh, economic growth in Cleveland, as we think about the growth of our region. First, for us, it's investing in specific educational pipelines to increase the number of four-year degrees awarded with specific training geared to those types of degrees that are gonna drive us forward. Um, there is no other partner uh, that's more important than the city's public research institution in driving the growth of talent. And everything we do and, and our success is gonna be predicated on how well we produce a talent pipeline. All successful cities have had a public research institution driving their growth, whether you pick Boston, Philadelphia, uh, St. Louis, uh, on and on. It's, it's always driven. We have that in our DNA. Uh, we'll always be about access and affordability. And we think every day about how to increase the flow of degrees so that uh, our companies and you know small, medium, and large uh, can use the talents of our graduates. Second, we have made improving and sustaining the health of our community our number one priority. As part of Cleveland State 2.0, we have uh, condensed our uh, eight colleges to six, and one of them is going to be our new College of Health Professions. And this is specifically geared to producing the kind of partnerships with our health systems in Cleveland. We have many strong health systems that are helping us drive growth. So that's, that's really important to our region. And as we build out our public health initiative, as we build out our new college, our commitment to the health of our community is, is front and center. Third, educating and completing the education of the 1.5 million Ohioans that have some college education and no degree. It's about 300,000 here in Northeast Ohio. Why is that important? Because we have a kind of a silent workforce that has to help drive that talent gap here in Cleveland. We are focused on this. We've got some exciting partnerships we're gonna talk about. And that leads to the fourth thing, doubling down on our partnerships. One of the things that Beiju uh, I know is gonna talk about is how we have to leverage the various initiatives that are happening in our community. Uh, we're doing that every day. We need to do more. Our recent partnership between GCP, Case Western Reserve and Cleveland State uh, to produce a corporate connector so that our students can get paid internships and externships at companies in town is one example. Uh, these are the kinds of things that are, are going to drive us forward. And then I think the last thing I'll say, Ben, as uh, a, a tee up to our conversation, this is a unique time here in Cleveland for all of us. Uh, we're in a transitional period. We're going to have new leadership at the city. We have new leadership like Beiju at very, very important institutions like GCP. Uh, we've got some relatively new, I'd like to think I'm still new, leadership at several of the major institutions. I just finished my third year. There is an energy. There is a commitment. There's a sense that this is our time. And I'm happy to have that conversation with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Harlan. Over to you, Beiju. Sure. Thank you, Ben. And thanks again for the warm welcome and for inviting me to be a part of this webinar with Harlan, who is... In full disclosure, one of my board members at the Greater Cleveland Partnership, as well as a steering committee member at the Cleveland Innovation Project. So I'm on, I'm on alert here as I'm with him in this forum. You know, I'm going to uh, just say in my opening remarks, just to set the stage, I've been at the Greater Cleveland Partnership now for five months. Uh, and in the five months, I've set forward for our organization three overarching priorities that I have for our team. The first is it builds on the concept that Harlan put in terms of partnerships and working in partnerships. Now that's built into our name. You know, ours, our organization is all about nurturing partnerships towards a greater Cleveland. 
but we've encapsulated it into a set of values, a set of values that we call our all-in values, reflects our mindset, our spirit, and the values by which we operate, not only internally, but importantly, across a number of external partnerships, civic partnerships. It starts with being inspired, setting bold aspirations and execution plans that match it. And then it ends with always working in unity. It's in unity towards community outcomes, as Harlan was describing. It's never about a single organization. It is working in partnership and lockstep for the benefit of the community. That's what all of us are doing. So my first priority was and continues to be establishing that infrastructure, that partnership among civic groups, with institutions like Cleveland State, with the private sector and with the public sector against then a series of important priorities, which is the second part. The second part, our board, including Harlan, has been involved in shaping an all-in vision and uh, strategic plan for our community. Uh, in that strategic plan, we've identified five important priorities that we are going to be pursuing, and Cleveland State is integral to each of those priorities, and I'll go through that uh, in a minute. And then the third is with that all-in mindset and that all-in plan, it comes in all-in around execution. You know, plans are are only as good as the execution that follows. For each of the priorities that we talk about, and we'll share more in the open dialogue, uh, we'll talk about how are we gonna execute, and how are we gonna execute in particular through partnerships towards outcomes. So in terms of our five priorities, I'll just be really brief about this. We've got a vision of collectively, this isn't about the Greater Clean Partnership, it's about the board, all of our members, our institutions, as well as our private sector, we believe that Cleveland has the potential to be one of the great regions in the Great Lakes. If you look across any number of indicators today, we are at best in the middle of the pack in the Midwest. Some places we're at the bottom of the pack, but we do have all of the infrastructure, all of the assets, all of the potential to be one of those great regions of the Great Lake. To capture that vision, it's gonna take five priorities. First is around dynamic businesses. Businesses that are thriving because of investments in technology and a focus on innovation. Cleveland State is an important partner in that effort through the research component of what the institution presents in addition to the talent. And we work closely with uh, centers such as the IoT Collaborative that Cleveland State and Case Western have partnered on to work with industry to really power innovation in that sector so that our manufacturing companies that have been our history can also be an important part of our future. But for dynamic businesses to thrive, they also need our second priority, which is abundant talent, which Harlan has described. All businesses today, it's not just an acute issue that we're facing because of the pandemic. This is a chronic challenge. Companies need talent. They need uh, uh, capable talent at all levels of development. And clearly the actions that Cleveland State uh, is taking, as Harlan's outlined in his four thrusts, are critical for our businesses to be able to continue to grow here in the greater Cleveland region. But a complement to that is the internships. And the internships are important because it enables that talent to get exposed to those companies in a way that when they graduate, I want talent that graduates from Cleveland State to have at least one job offer, if not multiple job offers, as a way to retain talent. We know that that's critical in our region where a lot of our talent that's transient our college student population will not stay in Cleveland naturally if they don't have that job offer. Cleveland State, again, is maybe a little bit different than some of our other institutions in that in terms of the population that's serving, but we want over time 100% of the students that Cleveland State's bringing from around the world to stay in Cleveland when they graduate with their Cleveland State degrees. The third uh, priority for us is to have abundant talent, you need to have inclusive opportunity. You need to make sure that we need to make sure that all residents in our region are participating in the growth sectors and in the growth fields. And Harlan and Cleveland State is one of those gateways for so many individuals that may be the first in their families to experience higher education, to get on a pathway to those sectors. And so the efforts that Cleveland State is taking in particular around those students that are the first in their families to uh, pursue higher education, it's critical. We need to do more of it and we need to put wraparound support to ensure our entire community is participating so that we have abundant talent. Now, our fourth priority is once you've got dynamic businesses and you've got talented individuals, they can live anywhere. Uh, and we wanna make sure they wanna live here. And to us, we know that in this 
era, it's not just about the job offer, it's about the community. Uh, people have choices. We need to make sure our community is appealing and appealing in particular to the next two generations. The generations that are enrolled in your university or have recently graduated from your university. And an appealing community is not just about physical uh, development, which we have got a lot on the drawing board, including you know, renovations and enhancements on the Cleveland State campus, but it's about the amenities around a community. It's about having parks and trails and arts and culture and music and all of those things that make a community rich and a diverse community. That's what we know the next two generations are looking for. And we as Cleveland need to be able to present that so that we have a comprehensive reason for why talent needs to stay here to power a dynamic business. And the fifth uh, priority for us is to rebuild a broader sense of business confidence in Cleveland as a great place to do business. Uh, as a Clevelander, uh, mo for most of my life, you know, it's taken us a long time as Clevelanders to become proud of Cleveland as a place to live. And I think we now exude Cleveland pride. We all have at least a dozen Cleveland related t-shirts in our respective, you know, uh, closets. That same pride we take in Cleveland is a great place to live. We need to, to be a great place to work and a great place to grow businesses. And the way that we get there is we talk about, instead of John D. Rockefeller, and Mark Hanna and individuals that were titans two centuries ago, we need to talk about 21st century businesses. People that are thriving in Cleveland in the 21st century, including individuals like Monty Ahuja. We need more of those stories to be well known throughout our business community. So our business leaders, our business executives, our business owners, they become ambassadors for Cleveland as a great place to do business. Those are our five priorities that we're pursuing at the Greater Cleveland Partnership. Again, with many all in on the execution that we think will uh, power us towards the vision that we've outlined. Thank you, Ben. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Beiju. So I think there are so many questions, of course, that we can ask about these and related topics. Uh, I think where I'd like to start is maybe kind of a broad question. And this is a question for both of you. And perhaps I'll allow Harlan to chime in first. And this, this question is, you know, when you think about the health of our business community, our region, what do you think is going well right now? And kind of a corollary to that, what might we need to improve upon as a region? So Harlan? Thanks, Ben. Uh, I think to, to promote a theme that Beiju uh, talked about and I talked about in our opening comments, I think what's going well is this is, at least for me in, my, in the beginning of my fourth year here, certainly, the farthest we've moved the ball and how we're all working together. And when you have the nonprofit community, the educational community, the business titans and leaders in town working in parallel in unison, um, that word travels, Ben. And it is traveling not just in Northeast Ohio, it's reaching the state level. You know, one of the uh, criticisms, fair or unfair, about Northeast Ohio is that it's so diverse and so broad that sometimes we're not as clear with our messaging as places like Columbus and even Cincinnati. And I think that is changing. And we can see it because we engage with the state leaders. And uh, I think we're in a much better place and a much more convergent place than, than we have been. So I would say that's an indicator of the health of the community. We're building those personal relationships. The organizations are not being parochial. We're talking about leveraging our assets and it's showing up from everything from the federal grants we're seeing at Cleveland State to the initiatives that are being supported at the state level. So I think that's an indicator of our community's health. Uh, and I'll defer to uh, uh, Beiju. I don't know if you wanna add, add to that. Yeah, you know, it's it's a broad question, Ben. Uh, I echo everything Harlan said. You know, if I if I think about our business community, which uh, beyond what Harlan talked about in terms of what's really working well in terms of the spirit of collaboration, the spirit of partnerships, the understanding that we're all in it together, uh, it's we we're we're at a different time than my history in Cleveland, where it feels like every business or organization that you turn to talk to is thriving on the demand side. There's a demand for the products. There's a demand for the services. 
Uh, there's demand that is so great that it cannot be fulfilled because of the two issues right. that we're all talking about. One is talent and talent. Then the second is supply chain, which again becomes in many cases a talent issue. So it's, um, it's a frustrating situation that we're at this place where every business wants to grow. And if we need to collectively figure out how we help deliver talent to support their growth here in the region so they don't seek to establish roots elsewhere to address the immediate demand that they're facing on their and their businesses. So it's, it's a kind of a paradox here of uh, riches, but also challenges. I, I would call that Beijing a good kind of problem, right? Because the, the, the other kind of problem is when you don't have demand and the businesses are struggling and they're, and they're, they're closing shop. We, we have the opposite happening now. We have, we have industry with incredible growth potential and, and they need the fuel for that growth. So those are certainly some some big strengths that we have in the region. And you mentioned the um, the challenge, Beiju, of talent being uh, f- you know one that comes to mind. Uh, do you have a sense? And I guess this is, this is also a question for both of you. Do you have a sense for um, how unique perhaps our challenges are here in Cleveland? I mean, you both interact with leaders all over the place in various parts of the country. Uh, how unique are we in the, our challenges and our opportunities compared with those uh, your your peers and others with whom you interact? You know, um, maybe I'll start, Harlan and, and Ed. I don't one. I don't think our situation is unique on, in, in terms of the acute situation. You know, there is a chronic situation. This talent situation was not just because of the pandemic. This has been a long-standing challenge for our region to be able to uh, develop and retain sufficient talent for the types of industries that are thriving in the 21st century. So that's a, that's an issue that I think we are differently situated on a, on a long-term basis than on the acute basis that everyone's facing. The other issue here is that we don't have the perception advantages that a Columbus has even nearby or an Indianapolis has nearby where businesses, if they're frustrated in regions like Cleveland, will believe that the situation will be easier in places that have a different reputation or perception, whether it's Indianapolis or Austin or Columbus, places that are growing. Uh, That's a unique challenge to us as, and it gets back to the perception that we've got to change, but then we've got to be able to deliver the talent uh, to match it so that the reality, the marketing is uh, met by the product that we actually deliver. Carl, a similar question, uh, yeah. Yeah, Ben, I'll just add to that, that we're, we're changing this perception every day. For Cleveland State to be up 20% in master's enrollments due to the great success of our CSU Global Program, which is really just starting out, it's only about 18 months old. For us to be up in enrollments overall in a time where the demographics, the economy, uh, and and, and folks have a lot of options it is incredible. For up to be up 5% in freshman enrollments, all those things uh, uh, give folks confidence when we grow because for us to get to where we wanna go, we have to talk about doing things to scale. Scale is the key. Yes, we're doing some great uh, uh, things on in many of our colleges and departments, but for the, for the region to grow, for, for, for Beiju and I to go to our, our, our city leadership, we have to be able to produce scale. And for us, that means significantly growing the number of students that, that we serve, really promoting our mission of access and affordability, which is in our DNA. It's who we are. It's why we've been successful with CSU Global. Um, these are the things that businesses need to hear. Now, the only thing I'll say on the other side We do need some help from the business leaders in the community because they're used to dealing with the acute issue. I need six chemical engineers tomorrow. I need four electrical and civil engineers. Um, There there is some area we need to meet in the middle. We have a lot of students that may not have the specific technical degree you want, but we're 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 a nation and a culture of training people on the job. And we need to be somewhat flexible and I have full confidence in our CSU students that are graduates, uh, regardless of their degree, if it's a liberal arts degree, an English degree, business degree, they're going to do a great job in the workforce. So we got a little bit of work to do there. And I know Beijing understands this. 
Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's an important point, Harlan, that you raise, and it's a conversation that I've been having, uh, I've been listening to, I should say, with a number of CEOs in our community. Um, a number of our CEOs in our community have started to recognize that uh, oftentimes their internal HR practices, you know, as to quote one of them, I won't say who it was, you know, it's basically you put a job description that, uh, you know, identifies the impossible and you settle for the improbable. But in the meantime, you suffer because you've got no one in the role. And when you actually break down the role in terms of what the essential traits are to execute the role inside of an organization, you can cut away a number of the factors, including specific education and training, right? because a lot of that can be provided in terms of the specific training that's required for a job by the employer. And what's interesting about the acute situation that we're facing now is educators have been saying this for years, right? Uh, have been talking about the versatility of talent and the ability for uh, individuals to shift. Uh, and it hasn't been necessarily uh, received well by the corporate community. Well, now you've got a situation because it's such an acute challenge that people are willing to rip up the old rules Playbook. It's an opportunity right. for us, I think, as a community broadly to say, how can we be at the leading edge of this so that individuals from not just Cleveland State, but other types of educational backgrounds can actually have an opportunity in roles that they might not have had an opportunity in two years ago. That's, that's something that you know we need to capitalize on because it's going to help our local companies and it's going to help our, uh, our students and talent. And if I may, if I may follow up just quickly, I'll give you two examples of what Beiju just talked about that have happened in the past couple of weeks. With the Cleveland Clinics and UHs and Sherwin Williams of the world, this isn't an issue because they need wide ranging workforce. Uh, they have wide ranging workforce needs, everything from IT to finance to healthcare. Those organizations have very, very deep HR uh, 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 departments and, and, and teams that can use all the talent we provide. Then, then let me give you another example of, of, a, of a smaller engineering firm where I talked to the CEO within the past couple of days and he says, I, I need licensed engineers. And, and my conversation with him is, no, you need one licensed engineer and then that licensed engineer can hire some people underneath him that we can supplement. That's a mindset change. And we are working on that, but it gives a sense of the broader scope. If we're gonna meet the needs of the small, medium and large companies, we need to be able to flex, but they need to be able to flex. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's certainly uh, from an HR professor, I would say that, you know, when you're trying to figure out what types of people you want for your job, you need to do some close job analysis and really understand what's required. And if there's something that's not required, then it probably shouldn't be something that you're looking for in your job applicants. So very well said. And I want to follow up a little bit on something you brought up, Harlan, which is, you know, I think that a lot of employers look at a higher education institution and think this is a source for talent. And that's true. That is one role that we play as, as a university. I'm, I'm curious to know from your perspective, um, how else, like beyond that, what are some of the potentially less obvious ways in which employers might engage with and benefit from higher education? So I don't know if this is less obvious, Ben, but it's certainly something that's proven successful across the country that we're going to emulate. And, and the one quickest way to get employers that that flow is to build out our co-op paid externship, paid internship programs. This is a model that's been incredibly successful across the country, particularly in Boston with Northeastern University, Philadelphia with Drexel University, and even in our state, the University of Cincinnati has done a great job in engineering uh, to do this. We are gonna build this out to scale with our partners. Uh, GCP is on board. Um, if you hire one of our graduates, whether it be freshman, after their freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, 90% of those students will get hired, regardless of their expertise. And, and this model works. Uh, we have some work to do integrating it into our academic curricula, whether they be for credit, whether they be for pay, they really need to be paid in this, in this economy for sure. Uh, but these are the practices that work. Uh, and, and for us to build this out, 
to scale. There isn't a CEO in town, not one that I've talked to that didn't say they would do this hands down, pay our students to be there. Um, now it's our job to connect our 16, 17,000 students with these opportunities. And hopefully over time, as we get to 20,000, as we get to 25,000 students, as we get to 30,000 students, that's going to change the face of Cleveland. Outstanding. So my next question is for Beiju. And given your role, and really, I think most of us who interact with at all with the business community uh, have heard a lot of frustrations, a lot of challenges that we've been hearing from various business leaders. And I'm curious to know from your perspective, what are some of the biggest frustrations? We've talked about talent, but maybe there are some other challenges, other frustrations that you've heard from business leaders that I'd be curious to know about. And then also, you know, for our uh, viewers here, our participants in this webinar, uh, how well is Cleveland poised to help address those challenges? What might we do better together? You know, so again, it, it's such a resounding echo on the talent one. It, it's hard, it's sort of, mask all the other uh, challenges that we hear about today in terms of frustrations. But you know, maybe I'll go back to you know, one of the comments that we've talked a little bit about in terms of we're getting better, but there has been a frustration among business leaders broadly in Cleveland that it doesn't feel like we have a, uh, a comprehensive, um, cohesive vision, plan, and commitment to a plan as a region. It's felt very fractured and fractious uh, not just among civic groups, but between the public sector and the private sector. And there's been a lot of um, issues in the past that, you know, business leaders have basically withdrawn from participating historically, I mean, in recent history, because, because of these situations. So that's been something that has certainly been uh, an issue that we are all you know, working very diligently to repair through this new kind of way of working together. Again, we've encapsulated into our all-in values. That's one critical thing. The second thing, and maybe it's a corollary, is in part of that, because, and Harlan shared this well, the corollary is because we haven't had that crystallized cohesive vision and commitment, we haven't gotten uh, the sufficient support from other sources, whether that's Columbus and the state government or the federal government, because we have too many disparate asks without an understanding of how things may be connected to each other, even if they are disparate asks. And so that's been an ongoing frustration that people have recognized as potentially a, something that's been holding our community back uh, in recent years as well. Thank you. Harlan, did you have something to add to that? Uh, only, to say, only to say that Beijing is helping change that perception. And, and, and I can only say the evidence when Jobs Ohio makes a big investment in the five partners, the three health systems, the two major universities, and Cleveland State now has $20 million of that partnership to invest in building out 19 specific degree programs, 16 existing and three new on, on it, in areas that we really need to push Cleveland forward. We're gonna double the number of degrees in these, in these areas over the next few years. I mean, that's a commitment we haven't seen and that's a sign that we're all working together. So I have a good question that came in to us via Facebook that I want to pose to both of you. And that question is as follows. Are there areas in which Cleveland has been or is within striking distance of being first, best, or unique in the world for some reason. Uh, the, the person asks, as a Clevelander, I love the words, but they are being said in many other locales. You know, um, there's probably, there's, there's a lot of way, different ways to answer that question of where are we first, best, or unique. I, I do believe that we, have been, and I think we can once again be one of the uh, best places, if not the first place, we may have been among the first, to really forge uh, comprehensive public-private partnerships that address these major challenges. That's something that is embedded in our DNA as a region. It's what powered uh, the growth of Cleveland. It powered the uh, revitalization of Cleveland, and it's something that I think can uh, power the acceleration of Cleveland. I think that is something that is there. 
that we truly can become among the best in executing to enable the vision. That's, that's one way of answering that question. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm gonna go big on this one, uh, Ben, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay something out there for Beiju too. Um, as somebody who is a, 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 fair, a fairly new to Cleveland and my family and I, we, we absolutely love it here. I think as a community, we need to spend some time talking about what differentiates ourselves. And for me, I will tell you, we should create some metric which talks about the quality of life here in Cleveland and how we stand out when you factor in uh, what it costs to live here, the park system, the quality of life, the ease of travel. I mean, I'm originally a New Yorker. I know I'm now telling 70 people this, please don't hold it against me. But there is no way I, I would rather live in an area where I'm commuting an hour and a half to work every day. So Beiju, I, I, I think this is a, a potentially uh, crystallizing moment where we should think about a marketing campaign and how we tell folks, hey, regardless, change whatever perceptions out there, this is a great place to live and create a metric where we are on top. I just got back from Phoenix, who so are working on a, uh, a couple of exciting partnerships with some universities there. There's 5.5 people that live in the desert. There's any water there. It's just completely brown. And yet that they've been able to, to recruit people there. And I know the weather is, is one of those factors, but we, we have a huge potential to do this year, Beiju. And I hope you share my thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah. When look, water one, water is critical for life. Nothing can live without water, right? So I think that we've got that going for us. You know, the, the thing that I'd add to it, Harlan, that I think is really important in particular for the millennials and the Gen Zs is what I hear consistently when I talk to those groups is they're looking for purpose and connectedness in their community. They want to be engaged. And to the quality of life comments and the commute issue, as well as the cost of living issue, I think Cleveland offers an opportunity for younger individuals in their 20s and 30s to be immediately engaged in whatever might be their passion because they have that opportunity both with time and resource that you do not have in the New York City metro area or other similar metro areas. And I think that's gotta be a part of our messaging as well because I know how important it is to those next two generations. Totally agree, totally agree. So I want you to kind of put on your thinking cap here for a moment. And I want for both of you to imagine that it's now September, 2022, so one year from now. And uh, the business community, the region is continuing to thrive, has thrived even more than maybe we expected it to. What kinds of things do you think would have happened between now and then for all of that to have occurred? The big question. Big question. You wanna start, Harlan? That's up to you. <laughs> Go ahead, far, far away, Beju. Fire away. All right. Well, you know, let's start with the Super Bowl victory. You know, <laughs> that's where we've got to start. You know, we may still be in the pennant race as well with the new uh, Guardians. That Those two things are important now. But, you know, for 22, this is going to be the, the challenge that we need to set uh, as a community is we need to have these bold, ambitious visions of where we want to be 10 years from now. But then we need to set a very ambitious, but attainable outcome for 2022. From my perspective, in terms of some of those things that we can look forward to in 2022, it is that you know, significantly expanded uh, experiential learning experience, right? Whether that's co-ops, internships, apprenticeships, but we're really getting the talent system and the uh, employers better connected. So we're addressing that acute need, but also addressing that broader uh, long-term chronic thing. And frankly, I think, it, you know, as Harlan has shared with me often, this becomes a marking advantage for a Cleveland state to bring students in, you know, so that the thousand international students that you welcome this year becomes 1,500 next year and 2,000 next year. So it really becomes a magnet for the talent that we're going to need over the long term. I think we also need to see uh, real progress against some of the more um, physical or tangible uh, developments that are on the drawing boards right now. Now we believe we should have cranes in the air around the Sherwin Williams headquarter tower on public square. And that sort of just energizes people's sense of progress that we're seeing that. 
But we also need to uh, importantly make sure that we've got achievements as it relates to more uh, long-term plans like we've announced for the lakefront and the riverfront, that there are things that we will do over the next year that might not look like cranes in the air, but should you know, continue to build confidence that those visions are coming to fruition and they're not just plans that are on the shelf. So those are some of the things that I think we can do in the next year to demonstrate that we are on trajectory towards the vision that we've outlined. I'll give you three things, short answer. 2,000 more students at CSU, a national championship for our bas men's basketball team. And the third is uh, three, breaking ground on three particular projects that are gonna help CSU grow. Our, our one-stop shop for co-ops and, and our corporate connector, uh, hopefully an, another academic and research building, and then a third yet to be undetermined project uh, so that will show, uh, to, to Beju's point, the energy and the commitment to growing our university. Wonderful. So I want to remind our participants that if they have a question, you can put it on Facebook, you can submit it through, through the Zoom, uh, and we'll get those, those questions uh, accordingly. So the next question I have kind of goes back to a theme that I've heard throughout both of your comments which is, you know, both of you place this really high value on partnerships and alliances and working together uh, for the greater good of our region. I want you to imagine that I'm running a manufacturing company, say it's a 10 to $300 million company. And as you both know, that describes a lot of Northeast Ohio. And uh, I'm listening to you both talk about these amazing things. And I'm thinking, well, okay, how can I better engage in the, the greater Cleveland business community? I don't do a whole lot there right now. What should I do? What are some things that, that I could potentially engage in? And how might that be beneficial for my business? And maybe I'll turn this first to Beijo. So, you know, I'll give you two answers to that, Ben. So first, if it's, if it's really specific around the business in a way that's gonna help the business, but also help the region, you know, host a number of interns or co-ops or apprenticeships. You know, it's, it's a mutually beneficial situation for the region and the company. It's an easy way to get engaged uh, with our community. There are multiple programs through which that can be done, but that is, that is the easiest way for a company. The second would be, you know, especially for manufacturing companies, get involved in smart manufacturing, work with the IoT collaborative, work with the Nottingham Spurk UI uh, global center, uh, or global innovation center that they're going to be opening up in a couple of weeks. But find a way to get engaged with local organizations, Cleveland State and others, that are pushing the boundaries because it's going to benefit your business. It's going to support the innovation that's going to power that 10 to $300 million business to hopefully become a 100 to $3 billion business over time. Those are two very direct things. Now, the third area is, you know, identify the passion that you've got for the community more broadly, right? Maybe you're excited about, you know, K-12 education. Maybe you're excited about arts and culture. Maybe you're excited about, you know, something else that contributes to the broader community, the broader quality of life and get engaged there as well. You know, that is not something that might directly benefit the company, but will benefit the employees of the company by ensuring that we have an even uh, better Cleveland for them to live in. Thank you. What do you think, uh, Beju, the only thing I'd add, Ben, is come see us. You really can't get a sense of, of what we're doing here at Cleveland State until you step foot on our campus, you talk to some of our students, you talk to our faculty uh, and the folks that are driving students into jobs every day. If you can't, I'm a tactile learner, so I, I like to I like to walk around and learn by talking to folks. So I would I would advise that CEO or that leadership team come come and see us, plug in, then we can figure out what the right connection is. And Beju's right. If, if it's not Cleveland State it, and it's and it's the it's it's one of the other great organizations in town, that's fine too. But to get involved. Uh, to, to get passionate about one of the organizations that's driving growth here in Cleveland, that, that's really important. So my academic background is primarily as an industrial and organizational psychologist. So I'm required by the, by the duties of my academic profession to ask you a leadership question, both of you. Yeah. Um, you know, my guess is that, you know, the pandemic isn't the first time that either of you have 
had to really navigate a time of high volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Uh, and I'm wondering, just from your own leadership experiences, either recently or in the past, what would you recommend for those leaders who are participating in this, who are watching this and listening, who are thinking, you know, I'm just trying to make sense of what's going on. I'm trying to figure out where to take my business. I'm, I'm going through uncharted waters. What kinds of recommendations would you have for them from a leader, leadership perspective? And maybe I can go to Harlan first on this one. So I, I, think, I think when it comes to charting a strategic course forward, I think, you know, my, my experience has been you, you, you got to listen before you move. And what you're hearing today from Beiju and I is, is a lot of different thoughts about how to engage, how to figure out where your particular passion and need is going to be. So, I mean, your, your background, Ben, it, you know, and, and, and we do this all the time is um, getting involved in the right circles. You know, I, I always describe, I, I describe Cleveland as big town, small town. You know, it's big enough to have the major benefits of a, of a, of a large city, but it's small enough that if you want to get involved, you can be an influence maker and, and you can move the needle here. Not every city you can do that in. So my advice would be, you know, reach out to folks like Beiju, reach out to the bridge builders in the community, make those connections first before you start coming to us. And we get a lot of CEOs, Beiju and I live this all the time. And they say, I need this and I need it yesterday. And we appreciate that. And we understand the pressures that you're under. Um, but as I told folks, you know, I wish we were an employment agency, but we're a research university. We have to build pipelines built on partnerships where we both invest. Perfect example is Parker Hannafin, big longtime partner of ours. And, and now we've built a living learning community where we have students that are succeeding at over 95% in terms of getting through. And these are students that in the past have had fairly low progression rates. And it's because the corporate can partner is there. They see the progress. They are now hiring the first graduates of this program, but it takes a little bit of time. So um, listen before you walk, talk to the folks, uh, and then come up with your strategy. Thank you. Beijing. No, so I'll, I'll maybe reflect on my um, background has been much more in the entrepreneurial space. So there's mm -hmm. always uncertainty, there's always ambiguity, and mostly doors are being slammed in your face, right? So my, uh, my advice, I guess, to the extent that there's advice is, you know, one, you've got to obviously hold your vision, keep, keep holding the vision, be flexible. And I like Harlan's, you know, be flexible and listen to lots of advisors on different pathways to approach achieving that vision. Okay? The path that you've defined may not be the right path, you know, have the humility to understand there are many others out there that may be able to guide you in alternate routes to get towards that vision, but hold the vision of what you're trying to actually accomplish through any type of uncertainty or ambiguity, and then seek that advice and be willing to be flexible on your journey by which you're gonna get there. So Beiju, I'd like to follow up on that a little bit. Uh, from your experience as an entrepreneur, you've always been a strong advocate for innovation. Um, how do you think business leaders right now should be thinking about innovation when maybe they're also thinking about, I just need people to show up to work. I don't have the employees I need. Uh, is there a time at which they should stop innovating? Uh, how should they navigate that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big believer, uh, not just as an entrepreneur, but having also worked as an advisor to some of uh, the largest organizations in the world, you've got to constantly be innovating in everything you do. And I think uh, because of technology, uh, and because of globalization, both of these things have come together. The cycle of innovation has shortened dramatically. So if you're not innovating, whether it's in your products, your services, or your operations, your competitors are absolutely innovating. And they're going to disrupt your business in a dramatic way. You cannot be so short-term focused on your acute challenge that you're not investing in those things that could be, you know, you need to be your own disruptor in everything that we are, are doing in the business world. Otherwise, your business is not going to survive in the 21st century. 
and I would say not only your business, but also your higher education institution. So I'd like to turn to Harlan and, and put the, a similar question to you. You know, you mentioned CSU 2.0 a little bit ago in your opening remarks. What are some of the things that you think we are innovating at CSU that excite you the most, perhaps, in the, the next quarter, the next year? Yeah. So thanks for that question, Ben. Uh, I think first and foremost now, one of the themes of our, our CSU 2.0 plan is uh, We've always been an anchor institution for Cleveland. We're, we're a little bit over 55 years old now, and it's time for us to be a beacon. And, you know, we, we, we have a great relationship and reputation here within the five surrounding counties. Uh, we're a first choice destination for many high school students. We are ready now to be a beacon and draw students in from elsewhere. And that's a big a, a pillar of CSU Global, which has proven to be incredible. And we're going to do that in a number of different areas as part of our CSU 2.0 plan. That's number one. So get our brand out there, market ourselves well. I'll be honest, higher education in general, the public sector of higher education, but we're not great marketers. We've let the for profits get that sphere. They are expert marketers and the quality is nowhere near what we're providing in the public sector. So uh, for us, uh, that's a that's a focus of mine. I, I'd like to take pride in the fact that, you know, I, I have a little background in, in, in marketing and, and how we sell our product and our product will sell. Uh, our, our price value proposition is is incredible. And and, and that's something uh, we're going to build upon. The second is that we're all in on student success, that when you walk through our doors, our faculty, our staff, and you're one of them, Ben, you know this. And we have this reputation. We're going to get the word out that we're committed to getting you through. Uh, our progression and graduation rates have been climbing, but they're not where we need them to be. We have to have that commitment that every student, we're going to touch every student and get them through. And we're going to do a better job of that. So those are the two things I would focus on, getting our brand out there and really getting the, the commitment to student success. We hired 10 graduation coaches in the last couple of years. They are not academic advisors, they're not tutors. Their main focus is to help students navigate college. And sometimes we assume, and, and, and it's a wrong assumption that first generation students know what to do, know where to go, know how to navigate. College can be challenging. So these are the kinds of things we know, we, we think we are really good at it, and we're gonna build on that. So this is a question that came to us uh, via the Q&A. And this question is, gentlemen, can you share the future of international business in Cleveland and how we navigate those types of items? You know, um, I was typing uh, one of the responses there, Ben. I, globalization is obviously gonna continue to accelerate. So whether it's large companies or small companies, uh, all these companies need to be able to work with suppliers, partners, you know, have market access to the 200 plus countries that are out there. Uh, it's incredibly important. So all business companies are thinking globally. Even my old uh, biotech firm that I'd started, you know, we started and we were immediately working with suppliers and partners around the world because that's just the way business is done and technology enables that. Thank you. So the last question that I'd like to pose, and this one is to Harlan. This has been a phenomenal conversation. Time flies when you're having fun. I'm watching the, the time okay. here closely. Um, but, you know, this is a very serious question, Harlan. You know, when you were at the University of Pennsylvania, the Eagles won the Super Bowl. And I just want to know, going back to something Beju said earlier, are you going to deliver a Super Bowl victory for Cleveland sometime soon? All right. So I'll tell my story since you brought it up. It's not just Philadelphia. I... I I lived in, uh, I, I got transferred in the military to Washington, D.C. in the late 80s. And the Redskins, and I'll be honest, I, I, I was not a Redskins fan, nor am I today. And that's not their name anymore, the Washington football team. Uh, I moved to Washington, and they won the Super Bowl. In the 90s, the Navy transferred me to New Orleans. And the Saints, who had never won anything, ever, and they haven't won anything since, won the Super Bowl. Uh, then I moved to Philadelphia in the, in the you know, a few years back probably five, five years ago. And the Eagles, who were terrible and never won a thing, won the Super Bowl. And I moved to Cleveland uh, in, you know, three years ago. When I moved here, the, the Browns had lost 31 of 32 games. So I told this story to the editor, the, the editorial staff at the Plain Dealer, and nobody laughed. And the question that they asked me was, you know, then, then I think one of them looked at me and said, if the Browns win four games, you're the mayor. 
So <laughs> since I've been here, not that I'm counting, the Browns have won. The first year they were seven and nine. Then they made the playoffs and beat the Steelers, okay, which I don't know how many times that's happened. Not a lot. And here we are this year, and they look really good. So, Ben, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I, I did tell this to Mayor Jackson, and uh, he kind of nodded. So we'll, we'll see what happens if they win the Super Bowl this year. Well, we appreciate your efforts on all of that, Harlan, for sure. Um, I'd like to offer you each just maybe, you know, 30 seconds or so to offer anything that you'd like to share that we haven't covered already regarding the state of business in Cleveland or anything else you'd like to share with our audience. So, Beju. You know, I'll just close by saying, Ben, this has been great to be here with you and with Harlan. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation around the state of business here in Cleveland and the vision for where I think we can take our region if we are truly working in partnerships, you know, towards the, uh, realizing all of the different aspects. For all of the, uh, the folks that have listened in, I want to just encourage you to get engaged, get engaged with Cleveland State, get engaged where, where it makes sense to you, both for your businesses, but also get engaged in the community to continue to help us build an even greater Cleveland. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I'll just say thank, uh, I'll say thank you all. I hope you sense Beiju and my passion for what we do, uh, how bullish we are on Cleveland, how ready we are to get on a plane and go recruit companies to, to be here with us. Uh, we're doing all the right things right now and to, to kind of circle back to uh, something Beige, you said earlier about vision requires execution. Uh, one of the quotes I use all the time is from Thomas Edison. I know he's still the largest patent holder in U.S. history, but he was also a very quotable guy. Vision without execution is hallucination. And we're very aware of that. Uh, Beige, you and I have talked about it. We look forward to talking uh, about this with you because we are ready to execute. Thank you very much, Harlan. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Before you go, though, I do want to uh, put out two different dates for you to save. The first one is October 28th, 2021. Uh, that is our next Cornerstone event. And then we have December 2nd, 2021. Both of those are from noon to 1 p.m. And that session on October 28th, uh, that's going to be with Tracy Porter, my colleague in the Department of Management, and Carolyn Leakin, who's the VP of HR at Sherwin-Williams. And they're going to be examining hybrid work post-pandemic, assessing what types of things might need to be included in organizations moving forward. I, I'm sure it'll be a fascinating conversation. So again, special thanks to Harlan and to Beiju for joining us. Really appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you to everyone who helped put this together. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us here today. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.